Glory to Jesus Christ. Sorry I'm late today. I was talking with someone and the time flew by. I thought it was quite quarter past one, and then Father Kevin came by and said, don't you have a class? And I said, <laughs> it's quarter past two. Do I raced in? So here we are. And we're on the UCAT. The UCAT. And today is the Feast of St. Francis Xavier. Do many of you remember the Novena of Grace? That would be... Uh, in Lent, usually, although I do remember sometimes there was a novena for St. Francis in uh, in December around his feast day. But the uh, novena of grace, a Jesuit would come in and preach, preach uh, to the, would have it at the, there'd be a, a, a he would preach at the, the for the children, we'd have a, a that and the, the hymns, I remember them, oh, Father St. Francis, we kneel at thy feet. And uh, um, a, a hymn written by, say, uh, attributed anyway to St. Francis Xavier, um, the title of which escapes me at this point. Lord, thou art the object of my love, not for the hope of endless joys above, not for the fear of endless pains below, but which those who love thee must not undergo, for thee and such it. For me and such as me thou once didst bear, the ignominious cross, the nails despair. A bloody crown transpires thy sacred brow, and every sweat, from every sweat, uh, a bloody issue flowed. Such is and was, such is and was thy love for me, such is and shall be still my love for thee. O Jesus, and I forget what the rest was. But that's uh, 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 attributed to St. Francis Xavier, this uh, act of consecration. So let's pray the prayer of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and then kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that, by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in this consolation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And St. Francis Xavier, your life there. December 3rd, St. Francis Xavier missionary and confessor, Jesuit, patron of foreign missions. The apostle of the Indies was born of the castle of Xavier in Navarre in Spain in 1506. He was of noble descent, and at the age of 18, he went to Paris to study philosophy. About four years later, St. Ignatius Loyola came to the same city and took up his abode in the College of St. Barbara which St. Francis belonged. At that time, St. Francis was full of the world and ambition. But the company of St. Ignatius exercised such a ben beneficent influence on him that he grew to be a changed man and became one of the first disciples of the saint. In 1536, he went to Venice with the first companions of St. Ignatius. After visiting Rome, he was ordained priest at Venice in 1537, and the first Jesuits made their vows before the Pope's nuncio. Shortly after the society had been established, St. Francis was sent to Portugal. In 1541, he set sail for India, which was to be the field of his labors for the rest of his life, and landed at Goa the following year. From that city, which he profoundly reformed, his apostolic labors extended to the coast of Malabar, to Travancore, Malacca, the Malaccas, and Ceylon. And in all these places, he converted numbers to Christianity. In 1549, he carried the light of faith to Japan, of which he became the first missionary, and where a flourishing Christian community soon arose. He remained in Japan two years, 
and, for, and four months, and returned to India in 1551. He then turned his eyes to China. After visiting Goa, he set sail in 1552 to carry out his resolve, but God was satisfied with his will. On the 23rd day after his departure from Malacca, he arrived at San Sian. On November 20th, a fever seized him. And alone upon a foreign shore, he died on Friday, December 2nd, 1552, at the age of 46. O God, who by the preaching and miracles of Blessed Francis, were pleased to gather into your church the nations of the Indies, mercifully grant that we who venerate his glorious merits may likewise follow the example of his virtues. Amen. And this is from a book that uh, Bill Concanon gave me here in the parish, Lives of the Saints, from Catholic Book Publishing, uh, Lives of the Saints for Every Day of the Year, edited by R Reverend Hugo Hoover, Cistercian, Ph.D., and what year was this from? 1955. So I was only two then. So there's that. Oh, I lost my page. So today we're on the UCAT and still on the sacraments. Still on the sacraments, which I can never get enough of, either meditating on them or receiving them. So we're on, this is page 143, uh, chapter 3, the sacraments of communion and mission. What are the names of the sacraments that, would, that serve to build up communion in the church? Someone who is baptized and confirmed can receive, moreover, a special mission in the church in two special sacraments, and thus be enlisted in the service of God, holy orders, and matrimony. The two sacraments have something in common. They are directed to the good of others, which is why Luther didn't really consider these true dominical sacraments because for him the, the sacrament had to be something that you were getting but in matrimony and in holy orders the recipient gets a lot the reality of grace but it's there these are vocational sacraments and they are in many ways for others there are sacraments of mission here you know, that you're sent out for something and in the West, the for about almost a thousand years anyway, the two sacraments were considered antithetical. You know, if you had one, you really shouldn't have the other. And uh, the reasoning was from Saint Paul in First Corinthians, I think it's chapter seven, about uh, how it's the the issue of this girl who doesn't want to get married. And apparently there was an arranged marriage and everything for her. And she's resisting it. And so they were asking St. Paul's, uh, as sort of the rabbi of this Christian community there, to, uh, he's as the apostle, as this learned man and one who knew Christ, literally even though he only met Christ after the resurrection and ascension, of whether this this girl, you know, about the but so he says she's free to marry if she wants, but it's better if she doesn't. Because if you marry, then in a sense your primary service and duties have to be to your family, to the husband, to the children, etc., to and to the extended family. Uh, but if you're not married, then you're free to devote much more of your time to the Lord. And as a celebrant priest, I say that really is true, but I have seen a marvelous ministry in married priests. 
and uh, especially in the our eastern eastern churches, the Catholic, eastern Catholic churches, but also the Orthodox churches, also among uh, you know Anglican priests and others who may have a very a strong sense of Catholic priesthood, Catholic sense of, of ministerial priesthood. And uh, anyway, but the, those are two sacraments of mission. And are they, if, if you're given the grace to uh, have both vocations, then, then that's a marvel. But of course, the, uh, the, sp the wife of the priest has to have the vocation too. And that, that can be very trying. Ask any uh, wife of a, a very active minister, because you live in a fishbowl. About it. everybody expe expects you to be expects you to be uh, a saint, and your children too, and all that. So it can often be a, a difficulty, and that the demands of vocation demands it. So the two sacraments have something in common. They are directed to the good of others. No one is ordained just for himself, and no one enters the married state merely for his own sake. The sacrament of holy orders and the sacrament of matrimony are supposed to build up the people of God. In other words, they are a channel to which God pours out love into the world, the love of service. <clears throat> sacrament of holy orders. This is a question 249. What happens in holy orders? The man who is ordained receives a gift of the Holy Spirit that gives him a sacred authority that is conferred upon him by Christ through the bishop. Being a priest does not mean just assuming an office or a ministry. Through holy orders, a priest receives as a gift a definitive power and a mission for his brothers and sisters in faith. So uh, they in in, uh, in in classical uh, Thomistic sacramental theology they talk about an ontological change using uh, Aristotelian categories, so, a, a change in a sense in being, and uh, this would be what they call you know, what we call the mark of the sacrament, the permanent sacraments, which could only receive once baptism, which is the most crucial of the sacraments. And, and should be the most transform the grace of which should be the most transforming. Confirmation, in which the baptism is confirmed, but it's a distinct sacrament. Although in the Eastern tradition, they're together, as is First Communion uh, and infancy. And in the West now, since the Council, the uh, converts, uh, if uh, someone's to be baptized, and we recognize as valid baptism, uh, baptisms done by Trinitarian uh, churches with the Trinitarian formula of, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in some, some way, that they are not, if they change the terms, then they're not valid. It's not a bad, it's, I'm not I'm baptizing in the name of, 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 of God, I'm baptizing in my own name. So uh, we don't have the authority to change the formulas as individuals and uh, father son baptized in the name of the father holy spirit with water and with the intent of doing what christ did and and uh, that can a valid baptism can be administered by people who don't believe in god at all but intend to do what the church intends to do uh, with christ and uh, before the council often it would say well uh, so many of the the Protestant churches don't intend to do it. They don't believe in baptismal regeneration. Others do, like the, the Lutheran churches uh, did. But even then, people were baptized, uh, uh, and, and not even conditionally. They were just baptized. Uh, I remember uh, one of the daughters of, I guess when I was a child, one of the daughters of uh, LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, the president, uh, was becoming Catholic, and she was Episcopalian, and apparently a rather high Episcopalian, and uh, I'm not referring to drug habits or uh, drinking habits, but the uh, uh, the the churchmanship, as they they would say in Anglicanism, that she had, you know, quote unquote, the smells and bells, 
and all that. Uh, very Catholic worship, Catholic uh, style worship. And um, but she, so there was probably, this was after the council too, and she it was not too long after the council, uh, because I think he was still president then. Uh, so it would have been before 68. And then um, uh, about that. But then uh, afterwards, we, we didn't hear that much about it. But if, if you know, a minister from a, a progressive Protestant church changes the formula, and this also goes for so-called Catholics if they change the formula. Uh, it's, it's, they do what, so it won't be quote unquote sexist. So they'll change it to create a redeemer sanctifier or something. That's invalid. That's an invalid baptism. But anyway, but everyone is baptized into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church if they're baptized validly. Uh, by, whether it's by pouring, immersion, or, uh, or even just sprinkling. So that would be a valid baptism. But uh, a valid ordination is another story. So of that, what is so um, the in uh, I think it was eighteen ninety eight. There was uh, there were questions over the validity of Anglican orders after the Oxford movement started getting going, and Anglo Catholicism and, and, and Anglicanism was um, should we say revived uh, in many ways, and uh, were people that had a Catholic understanding of of ordination. So they were claiming that they were validly baptized, they were validly ordained because uh, the people who broke off from the Catholic Church uh, were Catholic bishops and had, uh, there was laying on of hands and the like. But then Apostolic Ecore, the uh, encyclical or apostolic letter, I can't remember what it was, uh, by Leo the Thirteenth. Uh, said no, they're absolutely null and utterly void the of Anglican orders. Uh, since then, of course, there's been an infusion of old Catholic orders, and the because uh, they said they were on three levels that they the the uh, that it wasn't valid, and also they also appealed to uh, precedent, uh, juridical precedent in the church that. Uh, no Anglican priest was received, and uh, if the prison wanted to become a Catholic priest in prison, had to be ordained. And uh, but at the time of Edward, so Edward the Sixth, the son of Henry the Eighth, uh, there was a more radical Protestant Reformation uh, there. And when they put came out with an ordinal, which I believe was in 1550, that um, they wanted to eliminate uh, any whiff of this being a sacrificing priesthood. That is, that it's the sacrifice of Christ uh, that's presented there. Uh, and, and some probably would have had no real problem with that, but uh, the misunderstanding of Catholic and Orthodox, uh, I think, was that it was somehow, uh, that Christ was somehow uh, sacrificed over again, or that we it was our sacrifice that sort of added on to the sacrifice of Christ, or, or uh, superseded the sacrifice of Christ, uh, rather than that it is the sacrifice of Christ truly present at, at mass. And uh, a valid priest do that. So, so that was rejected, and uh, anything of that in the right was gone. And uh, even uh, there were other problems. There were other. Uh, uh, textual uh, gaps, shall we say, uh, some of which were restored under Elizabeth the first. I think they had to put the Vanny Craft of Spiritus in and some other stuff. Uh, but that, but the the link, the chain had been broken. That, that so this is what Apostolic Cory said about Anglican orders at the time, and um, Father Sullivan. Who was, and as I mentioned, there's the old Catholic orders, but also there's the new stuff of uh, issues of, of women bishops and all sorts of stuff that's uh, now uh, made this even 
more complicated that um, from a Catholic perspective. And uh, but in, in the, Lu of the Lutherans, there were Lutherans that had the, in uh, in the Scandinavia, in uh, Sweden, and Finland, which was I think part of uh, occupied by Sweden at the time. The um, the Catholic bishops went along with the Reformation. And, uh, and that, uh, there's never been a, a statement, an official statement on, on the Lutheran bishops. But the assumption is, the assumption has always been that they're not valid. Uh, for, uh, uh, since this goes, uh, any uh, Lutheran priest from Sweden, if he came into the Catholic Church, was ordained and not conditionally ordained absolutely. I don't know, maybe if they're ordained conditionally now, which can be often with Anglican priests. And it was Bishop Leonard, who had been Bishop of London, I believe, could prove that he had all Catholic orders. The old Catholics were people, they broke off in, uh, after Vatican I. And their orders actually came from uh, an earlier schism uh, in Utrecht. Uh, in the 18th century. And so they have valid orders. They have a Catholic understanding of the sacraments, etc. In fact, if, if they were using the, at that point anyway, they were using uh, the Roman Catholic, the Tridentine uh, formulas and, and ritual for ordination. And so uh, he could prove that he had old Catholic orders and, and that the bishop who, in, who had old Catholic orders, who in and uh, who was Anglican, and I, I don't even know, if maybe there would have been an Anglican bishop, uh, an old Catholic bishop who may have participated in his consecration as a bishop. Uh, I don't know. And uh, so he, it, but they all had a Catholic understanding of ordination, which was one of the, the issues, because they had rejected that official, the official line in Anglicanism uh, was that uh, this is not a, a sacrificial priesthood. That was their public, in, their public intent was not to do that. And so, uh, but their public intent was to do that. So he, he was uh, accepted when he wasn't even conditioned, he was not conditionally reordained or ordained. Because it's not reordination, it's ordination. The same with baptism, it's not rebaptism, it's baptism. If it's an issue with a, a baptism that's invalid, or it's a conditional, if there's a question uh, whether the person was actually validly baptized or not, or validly ordained or not. So, being a priest does not mean just assuming an office or a ministry. So, uh, you know, we all, cause we all have ministries in the church, but this... Ordination is much deeper than that. It's this ontological change. That there's this a reality, that imagery of ontological change, uh, as with the sacraments, with the mark. That was uh, uh, the phraseology used about that. Through holy orders, a priest receives as a gift a def definite power. But it's not a power to be abused, and it's not a power for oneself. It's a it's a power to be used for others. As uh, Father Di Lorenzo said when we were uh, preparing for ordination, we are being ordained to wash feet. That is to serve, and uh, the greater service is through the sacraments, especially the Eucharist. For uh, ordained to preach. Uh, ordained to teach, ordained to serve, ordained to visit, ordained to, to uh, study and to communicate the fruits of study, uh, ordained to counsel, ordained to encourage, or ordained to be a prayer leader and an example of prayer. But sadly, many, after, uh, many priests became rather secularized and never emphasized a lot of these things. For them, it was more social work, which is an aspect of it, but a, a minor aspect. And, and let's face it, most priests would not make, are not the best social workers. It's better to uh, make reference to a good uh, 
social worker, especially one who would have uh, Catholic ethics and uh, the like. But um, a better sort of counseling and all this other stuff is, is certainly a part of being a priest. And it's not just a job. It's not just an eight-hour job. It's a 24-hour thing. But, but uh, priests have the right to have time off. And as St. Paul pointed out, uh, priests and ministers like that have the right to be paid. They have a right to be uh, taken care of in that, that sense. So even though he, uh, in order to be free of any control that the parishioners are say, well, we don't like what you're saying, so we're not gonna, we're not gonna support you. That, that could be a problem. He had this other occupation, which was tent making. Uh, which he shared, the occupation he shared with Priscilla and Aquila, uh, uh, who were friends of his. So we have, the, this is a mission, uh, the sacrament of mission, the two sacraments of mission, marriage and ordination. How does the church understand the sacrament of holy orders? Only Christ is the true priest, the others being only his ministers. St. Thomas Aquinas. So if you have a problem with that, if you say it's not quote unquote too Protestant, take that up with Thomas Aquinas. No, it's very Catholic. Christ is the one priest, and the, uh, the other priests are his icons, his ministers, his channels. How does church, the church, and this is uh, 250 on page 144. The priests of the Old Covenant saw their duty as mediating between heavenly and earthly things, between God and his people. Since Christ is the one mediator between God and men, 1 Timothy 2.5, which is something we always have to not just remind ourselves, but remind others, especially in dealing with things like the intercession of the saints and the like, that Christ is the one mediator with the Father, the one mediator between God and men. So he, uh, Christ is the, 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 cha the one channel of grace between God, the Father, and, and men, and humanity. But it doesn't mean that others aren't channels of this in Christ and through Christ, uh, that the Holy Spirit doesn't flow to others through others. So, of course, Mary is a great example of a great channel of grace to others. But uh, a channel coming off the uh, infinite ocean of grace that Jesus Christ is. And the Holy Spirit is, and the Father is. Since Christ is the, new me is the one mediator between God and men, 1 Timothy 2.5, he perfected and ended that priesthood. This is the Old Testament priest. This is the, the sacrificing priesthood of sacrifices over and over and over again, animal sacrifices. So uh, one of the, the functions of a priest, and perhaps it was the major function, was to be a butcher. So the, the whole, the ancient pagan traditions of if you have to feed the gods, that's one of the functions of the human race, so they would do that, and so you'd have these sacrifices for the God, so animals, your best animals, all of that. So many uh, animals were quote unquote wasted through uh, these sacrifices to the gods. And this was brought in as where just about all the customs of the Torah are borrowed from pagan, the pagan neighbors or are direct parallels to them. And there's nothing wrong with that. As long as the meaning is changed, as long as the end is changed, as long as the, the goal is changed. The goal is the one God, not the gods. The goal is not manipulating heavenly uh, beings for our purpose. The goal is the worship of God. And, and so the customs, the meaning of the customs may change. So this continues. So let's say St. Francis Xavier goes off to India. And there are these customs that people are very attached to. And, uh, and you can see them as an, an evangelistic opportunity. 
So you change the meaning of it, and you, you if they say baptize it, just as uh, in the old law, these customs were circumcised, were brought in, uh, the, these customs were giving a new purpose. So sometimes they have the same meanings, you know, like, like a light, you know, the, the lighting of, of candles, the lighting of whatever, lighting of fire. Of, uh, of, uh, of whatever that so you have you know they have the feast of Diwali there that emphasize like well you could take those customs and then you could see oh actually uh, we already have those customs into some things like here in Advent with Advent wreath which I'm actually told comes from Lutheran practice in northern Germany so uh, and so that's that's accepted so lights candles all that but. Uh, all of these other things that they had. So um, you, you could see, but you have to make sure that the, it, uh, the custom is converted or the practice is converted, that it's not taken in whole hog, because the, the, uh, the Jewish adaptation would never go whole hog, would they, whole hog? Um, but uh, it, it has to be a compatible, uh, an, an expression of the faith. And sometimes, uh, the the meaning is lost and it just becomes almost I don't know why I do it so it just becomes a sort of superstition. But uh, to but we should remember what it is and the the priests and others should be, you know, saying what this custom is like the the custom in many places on Epiphany, uh, many places very cold of throwing the cross into the water and. Uh, uh, people diving in to get the cross, or even just dunking themselves in the cold water. To, well, that's a baptism renewal symbol, and then the cross is our salvation. That and I'm uh, being baptized. Is, we're being baptized into the merits, the all sufficient merits of Jesus Christ, you know, in, in His saving death and resurrection. But if you don't have no idea what this is, the, the, and many people, I'm sure many people don't, so the, there needs to be instruction. On, on the, the on the customs, and the as there's a Jewish saying: it is not the the Jew who keeps the Sabbath; it's the Sabbath that keeps the Jew. <clears throat> Too often, our customs can support our <coughs> our difficulties. They can communicate our faith. They can be very comforting, and often we remember that. Of, of my childhood instruction, it's the customs that I remember the most. The one custom is a Christmas tree, which is so uh, a lot of fundamentalists attack this as pagan or something like that. And then they try to say, oh, it's uh, uh, the Bible condemns going into the forest, cutting down a tree and, and, and plating it with gold and all that. And they say it's not a Christmas tree. No, they were talking about creating an idol, a, a probably a Babylonian god, or it could be a Canaanite god. So you go into the forest, get a tree, cut it down, and then carve this idol of the statue of the god in which the god would, could reside. So it could be, so that's what a, a classical idol, an idol, Adelon, is, uh, that's what it is. The god, the spirit, or whatever, goes into this object and is uh, uh, residing there, or at least visiting there in the uh, statue or, or, or whatever. And it could even be your soul, one of your souls, going in after death with the the Ka statues that the Egyptians had, where you know something happened to your body because you needed your embalmed body to really to really participate in the next life, and so your souls would need something to go. So a statue of you would recognize your face. So often that you the face would, would be they would try to have it as naturalistic as possible or as recognizable as possible. I mean, but the body, that you could have a, a body beautiful, you could have a perfect body, uh, or what they considered artistically a perfect body uh, for that. And uh, uh, even though you probably didn't look like that, your body wasn't like that. So, uh, so the priests did that. The priests uh, sort of presided at many of the customs, but their main thing, uh, the, the Kohenim, the Kohenim priests, the priests of the, the family of Aaron in the Old Testament, in the temple. So in time, the sacrifices could only be done in the temple. 
and uh, there were certain pagan sacrifices that would be rejected, unkosher animals, for example. So it was usually uh, there were cereal offerings, which wasn't meaning you know putting uh, wheaties there, but uh, that would be grain, grain offered to God. There were uh, wine libations, water libations that were being poured out of the sacrifices to the God. Uh, often the pagans would do wine libations to the deceased. Uh, and they pour it into the ground so that the, or into the grave of the, uh, for the per that the person could participate in this somehow or other. And then, um, so the sacrifice, we'd have the sacrifices. Uh, uh, there were the sacrifices of, of doves for the poor people. So we know that Joseph and Mary were poor because that's the offering, the temple offering they bring at the uh, quote unquote ransoming of the baby Jesus, the at the presentation in the temple. Or uh, sheep, sheep were a very common thing. This is why you know, Jesus is the Lamb of God, the sacrament. That's why the Passover lamb was so important. Uh, so that was that. And goats, the uh, uh, the uh, a kid goat, a, the, a lamb of a goat that was that was acceptable too, and oxen and the like. Incense, of course, was a very popular sacrifice, and that would go with all sorts of stuff. And so, the incense tradition continued, uh, even in uh, in uh, Jewish home rituals after the fall of the temple. But after the fall of the temple, you were mourning, so. Yeah, uh, and frankincense could only be burnt in the temple. The temple was gone. So, but you could have frankincense, but you could you couldn't burn it. You could just pass it around, and people would smell it. So, the spice box at a habarah or a Sabbath meal—that's uh, the origin of that. Uh, in that, so and incense and all that. So, incense is is big in the Book of Revelation in heaven. So uh, today, at what a reading we had right there from. Uh, Revelation 5, I believe it is, that the uh, the angel was offering incense, and the incense was the prayer of the saints. So it went up. The prayers of saints went up. But so the, uh, the angel was a, uh, a channel of presentation of this, the, the prayers of the saints. So as, as Christians, we say, yes, that that can be. But it, all, all the prayer, the presentation of prayer to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit is through Jesus and by Jesus as the one priest, as the mediator between God and man. And he can be the bridge, the mediator, because he is fully God and fully human, but united as one person, but two distinct, uh, uh, distinct and totally integrated uh, within that knows nature, each nature, uh, but one person. So, but so Jesus perfected and ended that priesthood. Although if I meet a Cohen who's a, a devout Jew, I often ask for a blessing. To give the Cohen blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. That blessing. After Christ, there can be an ordained priesthood only in Christ. In Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Not replacing it, not uh, transcending it, not uh, adding a big thing to it. But there's one thing that is added to the sacrifice of Christ. You are added to the sacrifice. You add yourself. So you be a living sacrifice, St. Paul says. Now this does not increase the merits of Christ's sacrifice, which is all sufficient. Indeed, anything God does, including God incarnate, is of infinite value. <clears throat> so there can only be an ordained priesthood only in Christ, in Christ's sacrifice on the cross, and through a calling and specific mission from Christ. So uh, there should be uh, vocation discerners, sort of professional ones, uh, uh, preferably people also trained in psychology and, and uh, various other things, but also in th uh, theology and, and the like to do this. Uh, but sadly, if you ever read Goodbye, Good Men, um, you know, from the 
uh, late 60s into the 90s anyway, uh, often that was the case, that tr more traditional, devout candidates were uh, rejected. And sadly, many who were highly secularized or uh, were moral relativists or, or manipulators, like I just read uh, this thing on Cardinal McCarrick, and that was hair-raising and disgusting, and, and how uh, you know, his, the, his ambition, his, his uh, absolutely bold ambition to become a uh, major archbishop, his preference was to be uh, the Archbishop of New York and to be a cardinal, and how he manipulated everybody. On, and, and on the side, apparently, uh, this my, great deal of testimony to this and a great deal of evidence, it seems, of his sexual predation, uh, of especially of uh, the people who were, quote unquote, vocationally vulnerable. So, you know, if you don't, uh, if you complain about this, we'll get that. And even when they often they did complain, uh, the authorities who are under him or who are friends of his, that it didn't go anywhere with that. Even stuff sent to Rome often. Uh, was uh, disappeared. It, it didn't really get to that. And sadly, Pope John Paul II believed the uh, advocates of McCarrick uh, rather than those who were warning about McCarrick. So uh, was he duped? Or was he coming from his experience in uh, Poland in which uh, uh, sexual crimes were often a form of false accusations were often a form of blackmail and an attempt to discredit uh, active clergy uh, who were uh, not falling into the communist line at the time. So uh, that scandal is uh, there, although it's certainly much better in the Catholic Church than it was, and much better for the most part in the Catholic Church than it is in a lot of institutions at this time. But that's not enough. It has to be uh, really totally dedicated to that. And there can be no covering up. Anyone who covers up has to go, no matter how high that person is uh, from here on in. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, of course, you know, the, but also the, the, there has to be justice for the accused. Often that doesn't happen either. If you're accused, you're just checked out. No, apparently no evidence, nothing. Uh, that that can't be either. But it is. A Catholic priest who administers the sacraments acts not on the basis of his own power or moral perfection, which unfortunately he often lacks. So there was a heresy called Donatism. And in some ways, Montanism to an earlier heresy. <clears throat> but <clears throat> Dont Montanism, I mean, uh, Donatism. So this was during the persecutions of Diocletian and earlier. And uh, so uh, Christians were often the administrators and just, you know, didn't want to, re didn't really want to persecute a lot. They had, you know, more important things to do, bigger fish to catch. And uh, uh, they just said, oh, it's some, just bribe us, just bribe us and we'll give you uh, a license, a libellum, uh, that's, or a, uh, a certificate that said you sacrificed to the gods for the genius of the emperor, etc. Or, uh, or people would actually bribe other people, they'd pay other people to do the sacrifice in their name, and then they'd get the thing. Or uh, there were varied, varied ways of doing things. Or you got caught, as in one case in, um, uh, I think it's modern Morocco, Quetha and Quetha. Um, the, uh, there was a raid, and this was, I think, under Decius in the third century. Um, the, uh, they caught, uh, a whole bunch of people there in this house, house church, that uh, was uh, 
a sort of storehouse also for all sorts of sacramentals and vestments and scripture, the scripture, and all sorts of, they even had uh, uh, slippers, uh, I think for baptism after you were baptized or whatever. They had all sorts of things, maybe the slippers were by the presbyters. They had, they were uh, uh, vessels including gold and silver, uh, chalices and things like that. And this is really early on that they're having this and uh, uh, so other things. And so all of this was confiscated, but uh, this bishop was caught there also, and I don't think they know what happened to him, if he was martyred or not, but he didn't resist, and he let them take take this. And, and say the, the more uh, zealous would say, oh, no, 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 um, you should have, even if they said, uh, uh, tell us where this stuff is, or we'll torture all the children and kill all these people in front of you. Uh, you know, you had to do that, or, or they were going to torture you or something, or even under torture, you were torturing. You said, all right, this is where it is. <clears throat> and so they took the scriptures and they would destroy them. One uh, clever thing some used to do, some Christians used to do, would say, hand over your, your sacred text. And they would hand over false gospels, Gnostic gospels, things that they would be quite happy to burn themselves, and then the, they were destroyed by the pagan authorities. Um, so that, so these donors said, well, these people are out. People who gave in during the persecutions, now the persecutions have let up or that they're over, they want to come back into the church. And those who are bishops, priests, etc., want to function as bishops, priests, etc. Uh, the donors said, absolutely not. Uh, maybe there is absolution, but uh, maybe you can only get it once. And if you commit a serious sin, especially this, and they said these people were traitors. They were literal people, who, literally people who handed over the scriptures, etc. Chalices and the like. The, um, so this is your out. You can never function again as a priest, or even uh, as a, as a you know, go to communion ever again. That was one of the more extreme. There, there, were, there was not just one Donatist sect, there were a bunch of them. I think the, the wildest one were the Circumcellians, who used to raid caravans. This was, you know, e even into the close to the time of St. Augustine. Uh, and they would have a priest with them, one of their priests. And uh, they'd say, you know, they, so people would be forcibly baptized into this. It's valid to be there what they would consider valid baptism, because they didn't consider Catholic baptism valid anymore because the Catholic bishops, even if they were upright themselves and didn't give in in persecution, were in communion with those who did. So they said there was no valid Catholic ordinations. Although in Augustine's time, even through the ministration of Augustine, there were a number of reconciliation of bishops, reconciliation of bishops and priests and congregations at the time. But I think Donatists were around up to the, the Muslim conquest and, and maybe even after uh, uh, but sadly the church the catholic church in north africa died out it was too it was an urban thing uh they were only just beginning really missionizing the berbers and the people up and then uh, that just all went and uh, unlike the egyptian church which resisted a lot for a long time and is still there's still some some 10 million uh Coptic Christians in Egypt now, maybe more, 15, I don't know, from that. But it's still only only 90% uh, uh, Muslim at this point. And persecution, and uh, 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 not officially, uh, official discrimination against Christians, but uh, not official persecution, but often uh, uh, violence against Christians often isn't even punished, isn't even looked into in Egypt and many Muslim countries. But rather the priest acts in persona Christi in the person of Christ. It's Christ who's ministered. So when I say I baptize you, it's Christ who's doing the bath. When I say this is my body, it's Christ who's saying that. When I say I absolve you, it's Christ who's saying that. And not just saying that, doing it. Through his ordination, the transforming 
healing and saving power of Christ is grafted onto him. An in interesting image there. Because a priest has nothing of his own. He's above all a servant. And the distinguishing characteristic of every authentic priest, therefore, is humble astonishment at his own vocation. Humble astonishment. At the humility is so crucial to, for anyone in ministerial service in the church, and especially for priests, and most especially for bishops, and above all, for the Pope. Uh, who, uh, who have, has the title uh, of St. Gregory the Great, the service of Orm Day, the servant of the servants of God. So, be the, so that's one of the things of the, uh, the scandal of McCarrick, this utter lack of humility and honesty uh, that was present there. Although he, could, he was very good, apparently, at ingratiating himself and impressing people in power. So that emphasizes how the great need for downward accountability within the church as well as upward this constant accountability for everyone, for our actions in the church. And the higher the person is, the more authority, the more power, the more influence, the greater the accountability has to be. So we'll be on uh, page uh, number 251 next week. So let's pray the Our Father. Let's pray it especially for bishops and priests, especially those in positions of authority that is Certainly, an unenviable position at this time, where one there is great demands are put on the bishops on all sides and attacks on all sides. So, yeah, so no matter what a bishop does or doesn't do, he's going to be attacked. And some, of course, the, the rabid enemies of the church will attack just because he is a bishop, just because he is a Catholic bishop. But others from different camps will attack from different things, and uh, and there's a great Temptation now, especially uh, with the uh, president-elect uh, touting his Catholic, being his that he's a Catholic, uh, uh, since he's a, 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 a has quote unquote converted to a militant pro-abortion thing, a bad Catholic, and uh, I certainly wouldn't be committed. I wouldn't. That that would be endangering my own salvation as well as being a scandal to everybody else. But then there are other bishops who are quite the opposite. Some, they seem to be some who are seem almost eager to give communion to pro-abortion politicians. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a big scandal right there. So let's pray the Our Father for all the bishops and for all people in positions of responsibility in church and state. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a wonderful day now. Blessed Lent, Advent. Maranatha, the Lord is coming. Come, Lord. Veni Domini Jesu. Come, Lord Jesus. And let's see who's waving. Father Paul Ring, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Robin Leonard, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Jen Heffernan, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Brian Cayley, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Bye now.